Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started, Jeff, and make some introductions. Um, I'm Charles Kuntz. I'm one of the surgeons at South Pole's, and we're really grateful for everybody turning up tonight. We've already got 41 people logged in, and I'm sure that there are more to come, uh, 43 now. Uh, this is an interesting and exciting topic, and that's kind of the reason why we picked it, because we figured that we'd have a lot of engagement and something that people are interested in, both from the vet side, because we get asked these questions all the time, about when, uh, when owners should desex their pets. And then on the owners and breeders side, um, also it's really interesting because they're being told different things by different people and they wanna know exactly what the best thing for their pet is. Um, the first speaker tonight, and we have a panel of speakers, the first speaker is um, Jeff Buckland. And Jeff has been with us for about two and a half years now. Um, and he's become kind of a fixture um, at Southpaws as being not only a great vet and um, uh, a great surgeon, but also a great fixer. <laughs> and uh, he's the one that people seem to call whenever anything's broken uh, in the hospital and he's very resourceful. And, and uh, I think that bodes well for his um, orthopedic career as well as his soft tissue career going forward. So Jeff graduated from the University of Melbourne in 2012 and uh, was in mixed practice in country Victoria out in the um, southwest of Victoria. Um, and he worked uh, for four years in uh, small animal medicine and surgery, um, and then also did some large animal practice as well. He moved then uh, to uh, Beaconsfield Vet Hospital a few years uh, ago, I think in about 2017. In 2018, he started his internship at Southpaws we liked him so much, we kept him on for a surgical internship, and then he stayed on for a surgical residency, which is really exciting for us because once we commit to somebody as a surgical resident, it means that we want to keep them around for a long time because we're really investing in them, and, uh, and we hope that they're going to spend the rest of their career with us, basically. Um, so uh, Jeff is going to speak on desexing and orthopedic disease, but before he starts, I just want to remind everybody that we are open. Uh, so uh, South Pause remains open in Victoria and uh, pet owners can travel more than five kilometers um, if there's a necessity. Um, and so certainly we have people from, still traveling from all over Victoria with their pets and we can provide a letter if they need one uh, to show to the police that they have an appointment with us. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, and hand over to Jeff, uh, who's going to be speaking about desexing and orthopedic disease. And after Jeff, we're going to have Paul who's going to talk about desexing and incontinence, and I'm going to wrap up the evening um, talking about desexing and uh, the incidence of cancer. So hope you guys enjoy the evening. We will have the chat running the whole time, and I will uh, be reviewing that to allow Jeff to concentrate on his lecture. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen uh, and you move your mouse down there, you'll see a little area that says chat, and that's where you can post questions. Um, and so you can, you can post them and then I will um, either, uh, Jeff will answer them at the end of his lecture or if it's something really pertinent or urgent, he may decide to answer them during the lecture. And I think I'll be the one who will tell him um, uh, that there are questions that have come up. So anyway, without further ado, uh, we'll hand it over to Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. Um, hope everyone's well tonight. Um, as Charles alluded to, I'll be talking about desexing and uh, its impacts on orthopedic disease. Um, so, um, as you said, I'm one of the surgical residents here at South Force. Um, we'll be getting the balls rolling, sorry, ball rolling tonight. Um, and so, a little bit of an overview for us. Um, we will be starting on uh, the boring old topic of always going over a little bit of physiology and anatomy of a few of our uh, topics and uh, then the effect that those areas can have, um, so the effect of removal of the sex hormones can have on those areas and then a little bit on some specific orthopedic diseases that we see most commonly um, being influenced by the, the lack of sex hormones, that being cranial ligament disease hip dysplasia, uh, canine hip dysplasia, and feline physeal dysplasia. So as with many hormonal systems in the body, um, a hypothalamic endocrine axis is responsible for um, the tightly regulated production of sex hormones. 
Um, we all know that the typical feedback loops exist, um, starting with the hypothalamus at the top there. Um, this one releases gonadotrophin-releasing hormone. We then get the stimulation in the pituitary to synthesize and release luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. Um, and finally, stimulating the testes um, for testis, testosterone, um, or in the females, just replace those um, testicles with some ovaries and you get some estrogens. So as the levels of sex hormones increase, uh, we then get uh, the production of GnRH decreasing due to our negative feedback loop. Uh, and of course, there are many, many targets for these hormones that we see throughout the body. Um, but we're only going to be focusing at least on my topic for orthopedic conditions. Um, and the main areas there are going to be our physis, the articular cartilage, tendons and ligaments. Sorry for slight delays at times. I'm working on two screens with some chat on one. So we've got a couple of tables here. Um, so the two types of, just to go really back to basics in terms of the development of the physis that we see, we've got two types of bone growth um, and those are intramembranous and endochondral ossification. Um, the endochondral ossification is where it's at as that's just responsible for the growth and development of our long bones. And that's more so where we're seeing the issues arise from early desexing. Um, the primary centers for ossification start very, very early in fetal, fetal growth. Um, and they happen in the center of the long bones. Um, we'll get to a slide um, in a second that sort of shows that. Um, right at the diaphysis where the nutrient foramen is. And then eventually the secondary centers form um, after birth. And we've got a few um, of the areas in the table here where we can see the, the various bones and where their secondary centers form um, at the different time frames. So once we have those secondary centers form, we then get the epiphyseal region um, in the center of those two areas of ossification um, with separate vasculature. And the earliest that we can see some of that um, come about is 28 days after conception in some of the bones. Um, but as for the most part, it's around about three to four months afterwards. Now we can see this in um, serial radiographs of um, puppies that had been taken. So um, here we have a, a three-day-old puppy, um, happens to be a, a Welsh Corgi, so the bones aren't going to be particularly well looking, but um, it's uh, taken over the first few months of its growth. So we have three days here, and uh, much I think hopefully everyone can see my mouse. Uh, we've got tibia, femur, a uh, little bit of calcaneus forming. You really can't see many of the tarsal bones at all, and some metacarpal bones just here. Um, and same with the pelvis, it all looks very, very strange. Uh, we then move on to 26 days, um, and we can start to see these secondary areas of ossification forming up here. Some of the met, um, metacarpal bones and the tarsal bones forming, and on the, uh, the tibia as well. We move on again to 42 days. Those are starting to become more prominent. We're seeing a little bit more evidence of the physis forming at both proximal and distal. And then by 62 days, um, we have got the um, physis looking much more like we're typically used to seeing in a lot of these bones. Um, and uh, even though they are a bit shorter, being a, a little corgi. Now, a bit more of a uh, diagrammatic approach to the physis. Um, it's made up of three main regions. Um, on the left, we've got a bit more of a zoomed out view with the secondary center of ossification just up here with its vasculature coming through. We have the physis sitting in this area here and we have the primary, sorry, that's secondary, I should say, secondary center there, primary center coming from up here with the um, initial artery. And over on the side, we have our um, zoomed in view of what the physis looks like. Uh, we've got uh, sort of three main regions. We have a, a fibrous area, which is sort of surrounding the physis, provides a bit of support and provides the chondrocytes to the growth plate. We then have the um, cartilaginous region, um, which can be split into the reserve, which is up here at number one. We have the proliferation zone here at number two, and then we have the hypertrophic zone at number um, six, if we can see it there. That third zone, the hypertrophic zone, can be split further into three sections. One is the maturation phase, second is the degradation zone, and then last is the zone um, of provisional calcification where osteophytes and osteoblasts start to form and calcify the, the cartilage that's forming as the bone is growing. So if we look at a little bit of the 
um, hormonal regulation acting on the growth plate. Um, it is multifactorial with many factors affecting the growth plate of bones, uh, the growth of bones uh, by encouraging increased activity at those growth plates. So um, with the production and ramping up of the sex hormones during puberty, for instance, we see a spike in the amount of growth seen as those chondrocytes are subjected to hyperplasia and hypertrophy, um, really, really start growing quite quickly. And before the cell lines are then um, exhausted, uh, I'm sorry, before uh, once all that testosterone has come through, they grow bigger and bigger, the cell lines are then exhausted and we lead to um, the growth plates then closing at specified times. So what happens when we don't have this regulation from, for instance, the testosterone and the estrogen to the growth plate? Well, we're going to end up with fairly unrestricted growth in that time. So unrestricted division, we still are going to get our stimulation from growth hormone, um, still having the thyroid uh, allowing more release of that. Um, so I just got to move my thing to see what that's. And uh, the insulin growth factor coming from the liver as well. And we end up getting delayed primary delayed closure of our physis, and that's going to increase our bone length um, overall. Now you might think, well, what's a um, long bone got to do with anything? Um, these are the, the typical times that we can see for normal range of growth plate closure. Now, this is all, of course, tightly regulated to ensure that we have correct conformation uh, in all of our bones and uh, there's not really any malformation that can occur. So um, a lot of our growth plates, um, we know typically in most small to medium-sized breeds, they're going to be closing anywhere between 5 to 12 months of age. Um, for a lot of the, the longer bones. Um, if we consider giant breeds, of course, we do know that a lot of the growth plates can take that little bit longer. And we can see that even the tibial tubercle um, or the apophysis, as it's sometimes known, doesn't necessarily close until about 15 to 18 months of age, which is quite a long time. Now, so before, what effect is this going to have and why should we can be concerned about it? Well, if we think about how tightly regulated everything in the body is, we start to understand how throwing something out as big as removing an entire hormonal stimulus can have drastic effects on the conformation and development of the bones. The timing of the growth um, plate closure is imperative to that normal conformation, as I said. And we only have to think of diseases that come from premature closure of growth plates, um, such as when trauma occurs in the ulna, um, or in other physes, and how that can lead to quite severe angular limb deformities at the time, and that can be very detrimental. Similar things can occur with delayed closure. Um, of course, instead of getting shorter bones, we're going to end up with longer bones, and the main areas we see this happen and causing that issue is going to be in the capital physis, mostly in cats, but can happen in dogs as well, uh, and the proximal tibia in the, um, the growth plates just here. So what we can see especially uh, also is that this delayed closure means that those growth plates are open for a much longer period of time and animals being animals getting into all sorts of uh, trauma, they are a weaker spot in the bone and can make them more predisposed to things like Salter Harris type fractures. So in, there's a little bit of um, work that's been done um, looking at uh, obviously early desexing and some of the work that we've seen uh, done that in animals desexed, especially in large breeds, less than six months of age, shown to have a 13-fold increased risk of a tibial plateau greater than 35 degrees. So we can see that looking a bit like that. That's uh, quite special. And the thought is that this is due to the results of continued growth of the cranial aspect of the tibia growth plate um, and somewhat more normal closure of the caudal aspect. Um, it's not 100% sure why. It's probably uh, thought to be that there's a tensional force coming from the patellar and quadriceps mechanism that is uh, allowing that growth plate to continue to grow with the force pulling up as opposed to the caudal aspect where we're getting more of a, a compressive effect happening um, and more likely to then close that part of the growth plate. Now, we know that um, tibial plateau angle is an important factor in our cruciate ligament disease. So there is one area where we've already found a, an issue that early desexing, as I said, in large breed dogs um, can cause an issue. Now, if we move on to the effects that this can have on the cartilage, 
Uh, we will be coming back to things like cruciate ligament and the, the capital physis a little bit later. Um, but if we move on to another tissue, um, in terms of cartilage, um, there are lots of studies that have been done in uh, human and mice models um, in regards to uh, how the, the cartilage can be affected. And we can see things like early degradation of cartilage, um, increased levels of synovitis, uh, increase uh, osteoarthritis and also decrease cartilage volume overall in those that either have just low levels of circulating sex hormone, that's not necessarily those that have been um, castrated or um, uh, definitely not humans for that matter, but uh, just low levels of testosterone in particular. And we know that in women, we can see uh, signs of um, osteoporosis, for instance, with lack of estrogen. Again, not too much of a big deal that we do see in dogs at this point, um, but that estrogen in itself can have some anti-inflammatory properties in women that do have joint disease. And there are some studies that show a little bit of a benefit in that with dogs. Again, not to the same extent that it is in humans, but we do know that these effects do happen with low sex hormones. Now, another big thing, and I don't mean the dogs just in front of us, is obesity. Um, now, Obesity plays a, a huge part in the development uh, post desexing of orthopedic disease. Um, the uh, bit of a happy story, the guy on the right that looks like quite the whale, he uh, enrolled in Jenny Craig and he uh, ended up losing about 50 pounds. So good on him. <laughs> Now, I've got a bit of a table here. So just going through some of the um, prevalence of obesity in, that we see in pets in the world. Um, there's a few various studies that have been done. You can see the, um, the names on the right there, just of the, the rates of obesity that we can see. Now, this isn't separated into entire versus desex. This is just as a whole. But we can see that England, um, the uh, sort of Western, uh, Western Australia apparently was a specified area, are all doing pretty well. Um, Australia as a whole, however, and Australia, uh, USA as a whole, not so good in terms of the, uh, the prevalence of obesity in dogs. Now, if we look a little bit closer into the study that was done on the Australian dogs, um, this was uh, done by um, McCreevy and it featured 2,661 dogs. We can see then this, this split here between um, the entire versus desexed animals is quite significant. Uh, we've got about 32% male entire um, overweight compared to 48%. Um, and there's another study that was conducted at Banfield um, Veterinary uh, Hospital. They looked at 27,000 dogs over their lifetime um, from 1998 to 2010 and compared the rates of obesity in four cohorts. They had those that were desexed less than six months, those that were desexed between six and 12 months, those that were desexed between one to five years, and those that were the entire controls. And they showed that there was between a 62 to 77% of the desexed animals were overweight in that study compared to 37% of the entire animals. Um, there was no difference between the um, timing of the neutering and whether or not obesity was likely to happen. So basically, we're saying that d in your dog, very high likelihood that you are going to lead to um, some form of obesity. Obviously, the rates of obesity have been shown to increase. Um, the current understanding of the development of why that occurs uh, in d animals is a relationship between a decreased metabolic rate uh, reduced activity levels and increased food intake uh, due to a change in feeding behavior. Um, there's lots of study that's been done on that. Um, a little bit of controversy there, but most of it is fairly supportive of um, the, the factors that can play a part. Now, this can also be um, based on the, the gender of the animal, um, with a lot of studies showing that females have a much higher incidence of obesity, um, even with or without um, desexing. So whilst that does play a part, just the gender in its own does play a role in increasing the likelihood of obesity in females. Now, um, so let's go to, we have an obese animal. Um, and again, in many human studies, again, I'm going to relate a few human studies here and there because they are a bit important. Um, and some canine studies that we've seen, uh, we know that obesity has direct effects on the overall loading of joints, more weight in the joints, obviously more pressure. 
and as well as the deleterious effects of the cartilage and synovial health um, through the production of inflammatory cytokines such as uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha and uh, interleukin-6. Uh, there is a large body of research into um, hyperleptinemia in humans um, and also in dogs as well. The evidence is quite supportive that this is a contributing factor in humans. In dogs, it's not as strong. Um, they do, uh, most obese dogs do have hyperleptinemia. Whether or not that then um, can lead to an increase in cartilage degradation due to the, the stimulation of our uh, matrix mel melatoproteinases or um, other uh, increases of synovitis is not 100% as of yet, but there is some data out there. Um, we, throughout these um, mechanisms that we can see on here, um, we can see that the, the neutering has indirect effects on the likelihood of developing osteoarthritis. Um, and the severity, once it manifests, um, by encouraging those inflammatory processes and altering the joint um, biomechanics. So again, obesity, big contributing factor to um, OA. And the result is that with the desexing, we're likely to see more of the obesity occur, and i.e. more um, issues with osteoarthritis and pain going forward. Uh, interestingly, uh, on the few studies that have been performed in dogs looking at the effect of uh, weight loss in actually treating osteoarthritis, um, the findings are very supportive that weight loss in itself can prove basically as an anti-inflammatory and that uh, is a, a great means to improving lameness. And I think that's something that we all really know and already recommend to a lot of our clients as the, the first step for osteoarthritis man management. So... That's hopefully all the boring stuff out of the way. Um, the key factors from the um, effects of the lack of sex hormone that we can have on various orthopedic structures is the direct effects on the chondrogenesis in our physis, i.e. the different times in physial closure and growth rate. Um, we have different uh, effects on cartilage metabolism, i.e. Uh, an increased amount of degradation with that lack of sex hormone. And we've got our indirect effects that um, body weight and osteoarthritis can have as a result of desexing. So we'll move on now to a little bit more um, specific orthopedic disease. So um, the first one we'll talk about is uh, cranial cruciate ligament disease. Um, then we'll talk a bit about hip dysplasia. And then lastly, about uh, feline capital physial disease. Now, I'm not going to go over the entire atiopathogenesis of um, cruciate diseases. That's definitely its own talk. Um, but a little bit of a brief summary on the, the major contributors shows that there's both uh, obviously genetic and environmental factors. Um, it is a progressive acquired degenerative disease with a cyclic nature encompassing inflammation, instability, um, although instability is not always um, associated and fibre tearing, um, and there's no one single causative factor that has been identified as of yet. Um, the end result, of course, is that it results in pain and the formation of osteoarthritis, as uh, well as the secondary effects on other joint structures, um, such as the menisci. Uh, we can see that there's uh, a lot of breeds that are obviously more predisposed, um, and that does skew research a bit in some of the studies that have been looked at in the effect that desexing can have on the prevalence of cranial cruciate ligament disease. Um, the most common breeds, uh, of course, that we see are the likes of Labradors, um, Newfoundlands, Rottweilers, and Staffies. Um, and the age of onset of cruciate disease is also a bit of a var variable with a wide range. So um, we can see anywhere between um, sort of 1 to even 15, um, but the most common being between sort of 2 and 6. Um, some breeds are a little different. We can see the likes of boxes. They love to get cruciates at sort of less than two years of age. Um, and that's just something a little bit special for them. Now, if we start looking a little bit more into the prevalence and the linking with desexting, um, there's about there's endless research out there that you can find um, looking into cruciate ligament disease and the possible causes. And quite a number of them investigate the link between that and neutering. Um, some of these studies are quite large. Um, for instance, the, the Witzberger study um, looked at a, the medical records over 40 years of over 1.2 million dogs and found that around about 5% of dogs had cruciate disease and that desexing increased that risk of cruciate ligament disease by about two times. 
Um, so the table on the right there, we can see that uh, there's um, sort of our most common breeds at the top here with the uh, percentage incidence, so around about 8% um, in the Rottweiler and Newfoundland, 5-6% um, to in the, the Labrador, and then our breeds down the bottom here that are much less common. And again, all of this fitting with the typical things that we would see on a, a daily basis with these animals, um, very, very low percentages. And in fact, greyhounds and fox terriers out of that uh, 5,000 animals, no cruise shoots whatsoever. Now, if we um, look a little bit uh, as a sample of one of another studies that was performed, this is by um, Hart. Um, overall, we're seeing around about a two to three fold increase again in the development of craniocruciate ligament if you are a neutered dog. Um, on the right there, um, we have a little table um, that just shows that the uh, the male intact in the green there, we've got zero out of the 26 do 226 dogs had a um, cruciate ligament. And then if you were desexed less than six months, you had 8.9% um, of those dogs. Uh, and again, even in six to 11 months of age, we're still seeing an increase in the prevalence of cruciate ligament disease. Um, females, uh, even more so. Um, now, this one was uh, in Golden Retrievers and Labradors, this particular study, looking overall at the, the joint uh, disorders being craniocruciate ligament disease and hip dysplasia. Um, so, female Golden Retrievers had a, uh, a much worse time when it came to desexing and the result of the removal of those sex hormones in the development of these joint disorders. Uh, on the left, we've got a few other um, uh, diseases there, uh, sorry, um, studies there, and across the board, we're seeing the vast majority showing around about a two to three fold increase in cruciate ligament disease if you are a neutered dog. And that can often be regardless of whether you desex early or even between six and 12 months. So, as I said, we're not going to harp on too much about the um, uh, each disease, just sort of the prevalence and the effects that it can have. Now, hip dysplasia, um, of course, is an even more complex uh, orthopedic condition than cruciate ligaments. Um, but if we were to broadly describe it, uh, we would say that the disease manifests uh, in genetically predisposed animals exposed to environmental factors that enhance the expression of that genetic weakness. Um, and so obviously the mainstay of, uh, mainstay of dysplasia um, and where most of the research is performed uh, is looking into joint laxity um, and this change in function of the joint through alterations in the passive and active stabilizers eventually leads to the um, lovely osteoarthritis that we all know and see and uh, then they come to us and we uh, put a new hip in. So that is a uh, shot of some beautiful looking hips there. That's a shot of some not as nice looking hips, but not the worst that we'll see. Um, and then when they come to us, we put some hip replacements in them and they uh, do much, much better. So um, just on the slide there, uh, the no one cause, of course, it's not completely understood at this point. And there's a, a combination of genetics, joint laxity, the morphology of the animal, um, environmental factors, things like obesity, again, playing a part, and of course, the neuter status. Now, just got a bit of a, um, a flow chart here to uh, try and make the pathogenesis of, the, of hip dysplasia a little bit simpler. Um, we've got a combination of failure in both passive and active stabilizers. Um, passive stabilizers being the joint capsule, the round ligament, um, the dorsal acetabular rim angle, the inclination of the acetabulum, and also the amount of joint fluid. Um, the active stabilizers, we of course have got the, the muscles surrounding the pelvic limb and, and um, hip. Now, when all of this works nicely, um, we get a normal hip, perfect stability, and no disease. When there is failure in these areas, um, we can see a decrease in that joint stability. We end up with tearing or stretching of the joint capsule and the round ligament, of course, as well. And that joint instability ends up coming into incongruity and instability more. Um, and that starts a vicious cycle of minor damage, which includes microfractures, cartilage erosion, um, and eventually getting into the realms of osteoarthritis, which we know is a cause of chronic pain, dysfunction, um, reduced mobility in the leg, and reduced quality of life, which ultimately um, can often result in um, increased mortality due to euthanasia um, and a shorter lifespan. 
If we now go on to the, um, the prevalence of hip dysplasia and looking at that in relation to our desexing, uh, we'll go back to the, the Witzberger study. Um, we can see that some of our favorite breeds, um, again, uh, affected by cranial cruciate ligament also um, have orthopedic woes with hip dysplasia. So in the study, um, castrated males were actually found to be much more likely to have hip dysplasia. Um, this sort of makes sense if we think back to the effect of testosterone can have in the likes of decreasing muscle mass, um, increasing the likelihood of that inflammation and osteoarthritis. Um, we also didn't cover it in two, I didn't sort of mention it earlier, but um, we can also see a decrease in ligament and tendon fiber diameter and strength with the lack of testosterone. Um, and then also in another study by Pasteur, I haven't got the, the stats on the slide, um, that was done in 2005. Um, this was looking at the um, prevalence of canine hip dysplasia in radiographs that were sent to the um, Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, so one of those that are uh, measuring for uh, hip dysplasia. And based on the radiographs that they saw, um, a lot of these breeds we were seeing hip dysplasia in about 50 to 70% of um, desexed animals. So it was quite a high prevalence and it may mean that it is somewhat underdiagnosed. I mean, some of these were, were very, very early stages and they may not have gone on to actually develop uh, chronic disease and osteoarthritis but the um, prevalence is, is quite staggering. So when neutering is concerned um, regarding the development of uh, canine hip dysplasia, we can see that obviously breed is a big, big factor um, in a lot of these ones, but um, also sex are, is an important factor and what, uh, especially if you're a male, and if, if you're then castrate, we're gonna see you have quite an increased uh, risk factor for developing hip dysplasia. Now, if we look a little bit deeper into the, um, the numbers as to what that will be, um, this is data um, from Hart again on a, a separate study um, involving, uh, actually no, it was the same study from cruciate ligament disease in Labradors and Golden Retrievers. We can see that, again, female Labradors have got a significantly higher risk of hip dysplasia um, compared with that of entire animals. So just on the um, right-hand side here, uh, intact females, about 3.6% of those were showing signs. Ooh, my light's gone out again. There we go. Compared with those that were desexed at less than six months of age, we've got 9.7%. So quite, quite the increase. Um, and again, even in males, the golden retrievers as well, intact males about 4% compared with 14% that were desexed less than six months of age. So um, in the, the Labradors, we didn't see it as much. So interestingly, golden retrievers have got a, uh, an increased predisposition. And again, this is more that probably that breed genetics that are coming into play and the expression of those genes is being enhanced by the fact that they are being dissexed. Um, overall, there's around about from uh, sort of if we bring all the studies together, about a two to three fold um, increased risk of hip dysplasia in a lot, again, a lot of these predisposed breeds. It's not going to be uh, little Yorkshire Terriers that are getting desex that are going to be more likely, but um, a lot of the breeds that we commonly see that we are increasing the risk by uh, performing a desexing. And lastly, um, we're gonna speak a little bit about um, feline capital physeal dysplasia. Um, now, sometimes this isn't seen as commonly in general practice, but um, we do see quite a few cases um, come into us. Um, so we've spoken already about the effects that uh, desexing can have on delaying the closure of the growth plate. Um, especially in the physis of cats that we can see this. Um, it is a disease, as I said earlier, that does affect dogs, but the link with neutering is much weaker. Um, so it is more of a, a traumatic case that we can see in, in dogs. So the change that we have in physial closure lengthens the time that that area of the femur is weaker and obviously is then uh, potentially subjected to trauma. So the scary part of this condition is that often in animals, uh, this happens in, they have no known trauma. They could just be walking around and their hip just slips um, and comes out. So typically a cat will uh, have their physial growth plate closed at around about eight to 10 months of age. Um, so that's not to say that this can't happen earlier in entire animals, it definitely can, um, but that is more so associated with trauma in those situations. 
in a desex cat, um, and males are much more common, um, and we'll see in the, the next slide, that can extend that closure time out to one to three years. That's a lot of time for something to go wrong with a cat that it can injure itself. So males in particular, um, so this is a study by um, Borak, uh, McNichols and Craig, three separate studies, all looking at um, feline capital physial dysplasia. We can see that males that were neutered less than six months of age, there was 50 of those cases out of the entire um, amount that they looked at had um, been these male neutered. So really it's, it's, not a, it's a no brainer. Desexing male cats less than six months of age has a huge risk of having uh, capital five seal dysplasia. There are other risk factors, of course. Um, so obese, um, uh, animals were also much more likely, and we can then link that back to our, our osteoarthritis, as well as our increased loading on the joint, um, causing that trauma in animals that are otherwise not doing anything. So um, what we've discussed here, so that's sort of um, a summary there of everything we discussed there. It's not the, the be all and end all of whether desexing um, should be performed. It's, it's sort of merely a bit of a reference and a, a starting point um, to weigh up against the costs and benefits surrounding the topic. So most of what I'm showing you tonight here has been in favor of keeping dogs and cats intact as uh, at least for a little bit longer as we can be reducing the, the chances of these diseases coming about. And whilst that may keep the orthopods out there happy, um, there are many, many other factors, um, a lot of which you'll hear from Charles and Paul um, a little bit later, that we can see that are beneficial in desexing. So there, there is no and, and may never be uh, a consensus on the timing or need for desexing. Um, we can just merely understand the effects that it can have. Um, and we know that there are tightly uh, controlled balance of sex hormones that are required for overall orthopedic disease. Um, we know that the loss of stimulus leads to delayed physeal closure, uh, and that can lead to capital physeal dysplasia in cats, contribute to cranial cruciate ligament in dogs, um, and also increase their risk of hip dysplasia, as well as uh, uh, the role obesity and osteoarthritis has to play um, in desexing as well. So uh, there's fairly good evidence that neutering, especially in certain breeds, increases these risks. Um, but remember that desexing is not a benign procedure. Um, so the risks and benefits, be aware of them um, so that when making these decisions, uh, things don't just go all balls up. And uh, that's me done. So uh, Jeff, there was a question here. Um, what's the significance of desexing in a one-year-old on that table, um, which was, I think, one of your first tables, which was comparing, um, let's see. I think it was one of your first ones. On cruciate disease? I think so, yeah. Uh, the significance of desexing at one year of age now, let me just move that out of the way. So in, at least in this particular study, we could see that golden retrievers, um, males at one year of age, um, we did not see the development of uh, cranial cruciate ligament disease um, in either male or female. So that may then be a, um, a benefit to delaying uh, desexing until that year of age to try and prevent, uh, not prevent it from happening, but decrease the risk, I should say. Uh, in hip dysplasia, however, I do believe that even desexing at one year of age, um, we were starting to see a few come through, but it is still much less so. Uh, so anything less than a year of age, increased risk. At a year of age, we're starting to see a bit more benefit to um, that timing of desexing. All right, and so I've just put on the chat box, there's an article, um, which is actually, it's not just an abstract, it's a full article on um, just basically guidelines for different breeds related to orthopedic disease and a couple of other things. And so if you guys go into the chat and click on that link, you can download that article or, or view that article in your, um, in your browser. So I'm just going to make Paul Crocker now a host here. Um, so he'll be able to share his screen. And uh, very quickly, uh, Paul, 
joined South Paul's about three years ago um, uh, as an internal medicine vet. And Paul has been a vet for about 20 years. And um, you can tell by his gray hair. And, uh, and he is triple membership. So his memberships in internal medicine, critical care, and radiology, I believe. Um, and he ran the internal medicine service at uh, Adelaide University for a couple of years as well. Um, so he has real interest in critical care, analgesia, diagnostic imaging, endocrinology, nephrology, and cardiorespiratory medicine. And he is absolutely invaluable in um, helping us manage our surgical patients um, and critical care patients, as well as seeing internal medicine referrals himself. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Paul now, and he's going to speak to you about uh, desexing and incontinence. So Paul, can you hear me? Are you there? Let's see. Paul, are you there? Paul, can you hear me? I think he's muted. Charles is acknowledging you. I think he's working something out. Okay. I'll see if I can unmute him myself. Give it just a minute. And if we can't get um, Paul going, I can go ahead and present. I uh, barely hear you, Paul. Well, this is going well. Oh, perfect. Got it now. Good work. Thanks. Okay, so we're just saying I'm just having a minor technical crisis trying to get my screen to come up. So bear with us, you know, because this is how these things go these days. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, Charles. Pleasure. Well deserved. Thank you. Um, now, what I am trying to get this to do is to share my other screen. So you've tried to get too technical and technological having two screens running at the same time, I believe. How's that look? Can you see that? I can see our logo. That's great. That's what I want you to see. Good. So we're all good. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you, Jeff, for that little talk, which I heard part of. The other part, I was frenziedly in the background going through my dis PowerPoint display because I turned it on and got a lovely message from Microsoft saying that there was corruption in my file and it would try to repair it, but it can't promise anything. So this could be interesting as we flick through these slides to see what pops up on the screen, but nonetheless. Um, so Charles has asked me this evening to speak about urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence and in particular, how that relates to the age of desexing or how the age of desexing can influence the onset of urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence. It's you know, a relatively common topic that keeps on coming up around and again and again and again. And there are a lot of people who have a lot of theories about the age of desexing and how it influences many things. But this urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence um, has been implicated both in occurring when animals are desexed early, when they're desexed late, um, across the whole spectrum of ages. So hopefully this little talk will go through some of the actual data um, surrounding that and some of the research that's been done into it and clarify things a little. Uh, so as Charles said, my name's uh, Paul Crocker and um, yeah, I am membered in internal medicine, emergency critical care and small animal radiology. And then I decided enough was enough. Sometimes there can be too much study. Okay, so the things that we're going to cover in this session this evening are, um, as Jeff said, we've got to do a little bit of annoying stuff to start off with some anatomy and physiology recap of the urinary tract. I'm going to quickly, very briefly in one slide, cover the differential diagnoses for incontinence and a brief diagnostic approach. And I've highlighted the A there because there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, so this is one of the thought processes that I use when I'm going through an uh, incontinent patient. Uh, we'll then cover what is USMI specifically, the importance of USMI, oh, there's the first glitch, um, signalment, 
of patients that present with USMI and the contributing factors, um, and in particular, the relationship or not between the age of desexing and the development of urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence. Uh, then finally, we're going to look at treatment options and uh, just draw some conclusions right at the end. So uh, first up, we've got anatomy. So this uh, illustration comes from Nelson and Kudo, the fifth edition. I believe there's a later edition. I'm sure the illustration is the same. Uh, first thing to point out is that it is grossly oversimplified. The, the system is nowhere near as simple as this, but it does have the important parts on it, or most of them, um, for us to consider when we're thinking about this particular disease. So importantly, we've got a representation of the spinal cord up the top. Um, this is a dog, and so the hypogastric nerve uh, provides innovation both with alpha and beta adrenergic nerves um, in the sympathetic nervous system to the bladder and the urethral sphincter. Um, and then the pelvic nerve comes from the segments S1 to S3, and that provides parasympathetic innovation to predominantly the detrusor of the bladder. Um, and then finally, we have the pudendal nerve, which provides somatic innovation to the external urethral sphincter. So that's the bit that allows us to, con well, one of the bits that allows us to consciously hold on. Um, the bit that was missing from this illustration is actually highlighting where the internal urethral sphincter is, and that is the part that we're most concerned about when we're considering urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence. So I just wanted to point that out there. Um, so the bladder, and I just briefly want to touch on, which is not covered in this picture, the musculature of the bladder and the urethra. Um, so smooth muscle predominates most of the way through uh, the bladder and the urethra. Um, in particular, here it comes, there we go, um, the detrusor muscle, muscle, the internal urethral sphincter and the proximal two thirds of the urethra are predominantly muscled with smooth muscle and they are under involuntary autonomic control. The final bit, which is innervated by the pudendal nerve is the skeletal muscle section, the distal third of the urethra and that has a degree of voluntary control surrounding it. Okay, so physiology. <laughs> Uh, again, grossly oversimplified, and, and I don't intend to go into a huge amount of detail about this. Um, the important things to note here is that voiding is a parasympathetic function, and urinary retention, deliberate urinary retention is a, well, actually, that's contradiction in terms of it can't be deliberate urinary intention, but urinary intention is a sympathetic function. I always like to think about it as uh, what are the things that you're going to be doing when you're running away from a tiger, hopefully not stopping to eat. Although that did pose the question to me why it is that often people, when they're in heightened states of fight and flight reflex, lose control of their bladder because it seems counterintuitive. Um, they, there has been a lot of work done into that and nobody can come to a conclusion as to why that particular phenomena happens. So there you go. Something to look into if anyone's begging for a research study. So importantly, the urinary retention is a sympathetic function is the part, can you see my mouse there? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, can see it. Lovely, thank you. So the sympathetic function is the part that we're most interested in. Up on this illustration here, we've got these two parts from the sympathetic innovation of the bladder. We've got beta adrenergic nerves and alpha adrenergic nerves. The beta adrenergic nerve actually causes relaxation of the detrusor muscle and allows the detrusor muscle in the bladder to relax and fill up with urine. The alpha adrenergic nerves come down and they directly innovate the internal urethral sphincter and also they inhibit the parasympathetic innovation of the detrusor. The parasympathetic innovation of the detrusor is the part that causes it to contract. So by both relaxing the detrusor muscle and inhibiting the nerve which tells it to contract, we're doing a double whammy on the bladder and we're allowing the bladder to fill up whilst at the same time keeping the internal urethral sphincter clamped shut. So this alpha adrenergic nerve is the important one and in particular the alpha adrenergic bit because alpha adrenergic uh, drug or drugs that stimulate alpha adrenergic receptors are important when it comes to treating this particular condition. Uh, so moving on, uh, the differential diagnoses for incontinence. Uh, as I said, there's more than one way to, to process this kind of information, but this is just a little flow chart that I made up of how I divide up patients or pick through the morass of history that you, you get when you're going through one of these patients um, and how we divide up the clinical science to hopefully drive us towards a pathway. So the first thing I want to look at when I've got a patient that's presenting with incontinence is whether their bladder is 
distended or non-distended. Uh, obviously, it's going to fluctuate a little bit because as the bladder empties out, it's going to not distend. But the important part is whether it spends a large amount of time distended or whether it's mostly empty. Um, then, as you can see in the top line, we don't need to go through all of the different lines because you, uh, see, where's my mouse? Sorry, I keep going to point things out on the um, wrong screen. So here's the urethral sphincter mechanism in continents up here. So the features of this are that they, the patients will have a non-distended bladder. They don't usually present with dysuria or polycuria, um, dysuria being um, altered urine function, displaying altered urine function and polycuria is in particular inappropriate urination, so urinating frequently and in other um, places other than where they're supposed to. Um, and the causes for that can either be congenital malformations of the urinary tract or urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence. Um, the other pathways, I guess, are for another lecture. Um, but it's, it's quite handy to divide things up and pass through all of our different causes or all of the different features of the incontinence to get to an end point. Uh, moving on, so a diagnostic approach, approach to incontinence, as always, history and physical exam. It usually stands you in good stead to get the history from the owner rather than the, the dog like this person is doing, um, but I'm sure she'll glean some kind of information from that conversation. Um, but yeah, there's so much in the history about the way in which these patients urinate, when they urinate, how they urinate, um, and and the way that they look when they do it, um, if they're straining, all of those sorts of things. We all know these um, features of different forms of incontinence and getting that really detailed information right from the get-go is important in trying to figure out what's going on in the end. Um, CBC and biochemistry. Um, we often see cases of incontinence that um, I, I would almost never see a case of incontinence into the hospital that I wouldn't review all of the blood work and things that have been done recently. Um, and if they haven't, I would repeat them because not all causes or not all displays of urinary incontinence and in particular polyuria and polydipsia um, are rooted in the urinary tract. Sometimes it's secondary to other more systemic diseases. So it's always important to review all of the information and in particular flags of systemic disease. And then it seems like a statement of the obvious, but going through a urinalysis and that is not just a dipstick. This is going to look like a little bit of an advert for IDEX at the moment because I've got illustrations of IDEX equipment here. Um, we mostly have IDEX equipment at Southpaws um, and uh, it, it stands us in good stead for processing a lot of these patients and I'm familiar with it so I put the pictures on here. So this is the dipstick analyzer. Um, a lot of people sort of look at the dipstick analyzer and go, well, that seems a little bit excessive, but it does provide a degree of consistency to the, the reading of um, these urine dipsticks and it takes guesswork out of it and inconsistency between different people reading them. So um, it's quite a useful tool just to make sure that we're getting the same sorts of results each time. Urine specific gravity cannot go past urine specific gravity um, without highlighting how often it seems to be emitted in workups of urinary incontinence and indeed urinary disease. It's a very, very important. I could talk all day about urine specific gravity. You'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to, um, but it is a very important feature of the workup, as is the urine sediment. And again, a piece of IDEX equipment here, the SETIVU DX. There's a lot of controversy about this piece of equipment and how useful it is. I think like any piece of equipment or diagnostic lab equipment, you need to take the results in the context of your, your patient um, and what your patient's doing. And if it's telling you something that doesn't seem to match with what the patient is doing in front of you, you question the veracity of the report and you, you ask yourself why. None of these pieces of equipment are going to be 100% infallible. But for those of you who are not familiar with it, this automatically spins down um, the urine sample that you put in there. It uses a very small fraction um, of a millimetre of urine, spins it down and then takes photo microscopic photographs of the urine sediment and uses AI, artificial intelligence, to process the images and identify different items on there. The one it seems to struggle the most with is uh, cockeye bacteria. It will often misflag those, but again, um, it helps you out to, the reports help you out to try and pass through it. So a useful item to add to your um, host of equipment. And then finally, a urine culture, um, also very, very important. Urinary tract infections are often the cause of uh, polyuria and polydipsia and can give the impression of urinary incontinence when in actual fact there's nothing neurologically wrong with the urinary tract at all. It's just that the blood is filling up quite quickly. And then 
and this is part of the feature of the workups of the urinary problems that we often see um, is diagnostic imaging. So nothing beats having a look at what's going on in the urinary tract after we've passed through everything else. So uh, first thing, ultrasound. We do a lot of ultrasounding of urinary tracts. Um, for anyone that's not familiar, this is a, an ultrasound screenshot of a bladder. This is the bladder wall down here. I have to admit it's a fairly grainy ultrasound shot of the bladder, but um, nonetheless, that's a, a reasonable picture of a bladder. Um, we do a lot of contrast excretory urography, so that's giving intravenous contrast agent and then running our patients th serially through, or at least this section of their abdomen serially through the CT scanner um, in order to map out things like their ureters, the renal pelvis ureters, and what you can't see here is the bladder and filling defects. This is particularly useful for, I keep moving the mouse on the wrong screen, um, sorry, this is particularly useful for uh, examining ectopic ureters and things, as you can imagine. It's not necessary, however, to have a CT scanner in order to make use of this technique. You can do still images and get a lot of information just from plain old digital or even, oh God forbid, um, manually exposed films or manually developed films. Um, another piece of the puzzle which is often omitted is a retrograde vaginourethrogram so literally backfilling the vagina and the urethra with contrast agent to look for filling defects masses those sorts of things and then finally well when all else fails cystoscopy is very very useful sticking a camera in where the sun don't shine and really having a look around and looking for things like ectopic ureters. So that's that's a, an example of an ectopic ureter there. So the bladder is actually inside that black hole. This is kind of really in the neck of the bladder. We're right at that urethral sphincter and this ectopic ureter that is, is emptying urine into the ureter, uh, sorry, into the urethra rather than into the body of the bladder. So that brings us to the question of what is urethral sphincter mechanism incontin incompetence, not incontinence, although they're probably reasonably interchangeable. Um, it's also known as estrogen dependent incontinence, nocturnal incontinence, um, or hormonal incontinence, which I seem to have sped, spelt strangely, but that's okay. Um, in any case, it is a form of overflow incontinence. So when the intravesicular pressure of the bladder, when the bladder fills up, is greater than the urethral closing pressure. So the thing that is, we, we looked at that illustration before where the alpha adrenergic um, nerves were going down and innovating the urethral sphincter and keeping it clamped shut. But if the pressure inside the bladder gets greater than the ability to keep that clamp shut, then we can get overflow incontinence. And that's what urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence actually is. Um, so some etiologies for decre decreased urethral closing pressure, urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence, I'm going to keep tripping on that, I can tell, is not the only thing that can cause a decrease in that urethral closing pressure. Um, other conditions that can do it, this is not by any means an exhaustive list, are uh, uh, intervertebral disc disease, sorry about that, degenerative myelopathy, just plain old trauma, spinal malformations, and a very uncommonly diagnosed condition, dysautonomia, um, none of which bear going into, but you can see a common thread with all of these and that they're neurogenic conditions. And so all, any time that we ha are evaluating a, a potential urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence case, doing a full neurological exam is really, really super important. We need to be able to go through and rule out all of the other conditions that might be influencing the neurological function of the proximal urethra or the, I'm sorry, internal urethral sphincter. So urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's really the one that you come to when you've ruled everything else out. Um, and just briefly, the, the most common clinical signs, most of you out there who are practicing in general practice would be well familiar with this. It's, it's the noxuria. It's these patients are often brought to you and they say that they just, leaving a puddle where they're lying when they're either asleep at night, that's the most common presentation, or even during the day after they lie down, they get overflowing continence. Often they're not aware of it. Um, and, you know, the patient is just, they get up and look back and go, oh, whoops, and go outside and there's a puddle of, of urine lying around somewhere. It can be daily or it can be episodic, I mean, more frequently than daily. And the severity can range from very mild to very, very severe, almost incapacitating. And some animals just cannot retain any sort of, um, or cannot maintain any sort of urinary retention at all in the very severe cases. 
So the importance of this condition, um, there's been a couple of um, surveys, a little bit of research into the impact that incontinence has on pet retention. Um, in, and in particular, um, there was a study in 2010 of uh, a survey of UK veterinarians, and it was the second, or oh, sorry, urinary incontinence um, was the second most commonly cited reason for not neutering bitches. Uh, this, this was from vets. So the vets were actually surveyed to say what, what would be the common reasons that they would quote for not going ahead and neutering a, a female dog. Um, I practiced in the UK for a little while and it was certainly my experience that the rate of undesexed female dogs in the UK was certainly a lot greater than we have here in Australia. Um, consequently, we saw a lot more pyometras and I, I got very good at doing pyometra surgery when I was in the UK. Um, but yeah, it was second most commonly cited reason or justification I should, is probably a better way to put it for not neutering bitches. Um, the first most, I, I immediately went, well, what was the first one? And that was weight gain. Um, so that's a whole other talk as well, which we're not really going to go into today. Also in a study by Salomon in 2000, these were a little while ago, obviously, um, urinary incontinence was quoted as the sole reason and nine and a half percent of the, the survey participants um, quoted it as the sole reason and part of the reason for 18 and a half percent for voluntary relinquishment of pets to, to 12 shelters in the US. So they, they surveyed these 12 shelters, shelters across the US and asked the people who had relinquished their pets why it was that they were offering them up. Um, and yeah, for nine and a half percent of people, it was because they had urinary incontinence. Um, it didn't really go into great detail about how much effort had gone into resolving the incontinence before they handed them up. But yeah, it clearly has a significant impact, um, usually on the owner pet bond. Um, people get you know really tired of going around and cleaning up piles of wee everywhere. Um, so uh, it's an important thing that we need to take into account and we need to be able to manage it as, as we all know in general practice, it's not an uncommon thing. So we're going to look at the signalment of the patients that will present with USMI. First of all, age and weight and how they uh, apply to this. So in terms of age, um, it is usually a disease of young to middle-aged dogs. Um, I've put these two in reverse direction. The average age of onset is about three years, um, but it can, clinical signs can appear anytime from immediately after desexing the patient right through until 10 years of age. So there can be a significant delay in be between the time that they're desexed and the onset of the clinical signs. So really anywhere in that age range, if a patient spontaneously develops nocturia and doesn't appear to have any other thing wrong with them, then um, if they're female and they've been desexed, there's a high chance that it probably is urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence. Um, and the issue of weight and how does the weight of the patient influence the onset of this disease? Um, obviously, Jeff went into great detail about how it influences bone growth. Um, but uh, in this particular instance, the larger the breed dog, the more likely it is that urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence will occur. So it's more common in dogs greater than 15 kilos. And in fact, dogs under 15 kilos have a seven times greater prevalence of the disease um, than, sorry, I've written that backwards. Dogs greater than 15 kilos are seven times more likely to have urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence than dogs under 15. I really did write that in possibly the worst and most confusing way. <laughs> anyway, moving on, we can no longer see it. Um, so the next thing is signalment and the question of sex. Obviously this is a disease that is most commonly associated with female dogs and in particular desexed female dogs. So between 5.1 to 20% of desexed female dogs are expected to present with this particular condition. Um, it can, however, also occur in intact female dogs. So not all dogs that um, are intact, if they, if you go through the process of working through their incontinence and come to the conclusion that there is no other cause for it, then they may still have urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence, incompetence as well. Um, and that goes a little bit to the mechanism of the disease that we're going to cover in a little bit. Um, finally, male, males can also develop this disease. Incontinence in general is um, the presentation of incontinence, less than 4% of all incontinence cases are male. And in those cases, uh, they're more commonly congenital 
uh, malformations like ectopic urogens and things like that. But it is absolutely true that urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence can occur in male dogs. So don't discount it just because it's a boy that's coming in and they're leaking urine. Um, don't discount it as a possibility. And it can occur in both entire and castrated male dogs as well. So half of male dogs affected by urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence are intact. Um, there has been some association uh, drawn between testosterone and the absence of testosterone. Um, they, they've called it testosterone responsive incontinence. Um, and the evidence is not strong for um, testosterone having a high influence on it, but that's again, a, an entirely different talk. It's inconsistent, the response to with these patients being treated with testosterone. Um, breed is a big one. Um, there are several large breeds of dogs which are more prone to this condition. Is a, a list again, by no means exhaustive, but these are breeds of dog that are commonly uh, beset by this condition. Uh, the list for smaller breeds is a lot smaller. In fact, uh, miniature poodles is really the one that stands out and crops up the most. There will, of course, be it can affect any any breed of dog, and there will, of course, be examples of small breeds and large breeds that are not on these, not on these lists that will. Uh, contract the disease, contract, I'm not sure if that's said, develop the disease um, during their lifetime. So, um, and species, uh, I just threw this in for laughs a, a little bit. I mean, cats, it's very rare to have a diagnosis of urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence in cats, but it has been diagnosed. And there is, in those patients that uh, have been diagnosed with it, there's often an association with feline leukemia virus. So any patient that does get a diagnosis of this, it's, um, it, it behooves the diagnostician to look for feline leukemia virus infection as well. And obviously humans as well, the, the diseases are somewhat analogous um, in that in humans, the internal urethral sphincter can be weakened in, in some humans and cause a similar kind of condition but I am not a doctor, so, well, not a human doctor, obviously, so I will speak no more of that. Um, but now what I wanna look at is the contributing factors to urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence. And I've called it that because really, we don't actually know what causes the problem. There are a number of things that are thought to contribute to it, but nobody's really clear on what the exact mechanism is. Broadly, the groups are, there's hormonal contributing factors, structural, and functional, and then the question of whether the age at desexing and the adult weight of the patient has any influence over the development of the disease. So we'll briefly touch on those sections. Um, hormonal first, oestrogen, the, you know, the alternate name for the disease is oestrogen dependent incontinence. Um, for those who are interested, that is a crystallized version under polarized light of oestrogen, the hormone. Somebody did a, a big study on what all of the different hormones in the body look like when they are distilled out and crystallized. And there's some very pretty pictures to look at if anyone gets bored on that. Um, but anyway, so oestrogen. Um, there are receptors in the urethral sphincter for oestrogen, quite a number of them. And uh, when estrogen binds to them, they sensitize the alpha receptors to catecholamines. So they just make the urethral sphincter more responsive to uh, the catecholamines that are released by those alpha adrenergic receptors. And therefore, it increases the urethral tone. And that's the role that estrogen has in controlling this particular condition. There is a problem with this as an overarching theory as to the... Um, the oestrogen deficit is the cause of the disease. And that's because even in entire bitches, when they're in non-oestrous, non they have similar estrogen levels to neutered uh, bitches. And yet the problem is still more prevalent in the neutered bitches than it is in bitches that are in inter-oestrous periods. So it doesn't, it basically means that not all cases will respond to estrogen. Um, the other hormone that can be involved here, Jeff touched on earlier in his talk, is GnRH. And GnRH is the hormone that is released from the hypothalamus, just to cover it again. Um, and there are receptors on the anterior pituitary that bind to GnRH that signals the anterior pituitary to release lignizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. What does this have to do with the urethral sphincter? Well, it's been proposed that increased levels of lignizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone in spade bitches have, uh, could be a mechanism for influencing urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence. In that once you spay a dog, the feedback on the system from the ovaries um, is no longer there. And so increasing levels of GnRH are released to prompt 
the release of more luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, those hormones go up and may, may have uh, an influence on the development of the disease. Um, this, see, this is a little counterintuitive initially, but um, exogenous GnRH um, can be used, we'll see later on, to try and treat this condition in some cases. And that works by actually down-regulating the receptors on the anterior, anterior pituitary. So by constantly exposing the pituitary to GnRH levels from an ex external source, exogenous GnRH, um, the receptors are down-regulated and that translates to a reduction in luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating produ hormone production. Uh, next one is structural changes. So in um, neutered bitches, there are changes in the collagen to muscle ratio. Um, in, so a very uter a very uterectomy um, patients, there's an increased ratio um, of collagen to muscle, less muscle and more collagen. Um, and yeah, I found this when I was looking for collagen injections and injecting collagen, things are hardly surprising. Although it did occur to me for those of you who are listening and watching who are old enough to remember the Muppets and Dr. Teeth in the Electric Mayhem, this person does look a little bit like Janice. Um, so <laughs> just a uh, uh, harken back to my childhood there. Um, spade bitches also have, tend to have shorter urethras and intrapelvic bladders, and this can contribute. And obviously there's the perception that neutered dogs will have increased fat deposition as well. Um, and so, and increasing fat deposition or in around the urethra and the bladder can also influence the, the uh, disease as well. And finally, functional neut decreased, sorry, neutered bitches will have decreased urethral closure pressure within one year of a very uterectomy. But it doesn't mean that every D sex dog will get the problem. Um, many of them remain continent, but over across the board, all dogs that have been desexed or bitches that have been desexed will have on average a decreased urethral closure pressure. So this relationship between this condition and a very uterectomy, um, historically there's been a lot of conflicting evidence concerning this relationship. Um, so in the eighties, uh, there were a couple of studies by Holt and Arnold, um, not together, they were separate studies, um, that declared that there was a decrease or found there was a decreased level of incontinence if you desex a bitch prior to her first heat. Um, in 1998, another study concluded that there was no relationship between the timing of a, a varioterectomy and urethral sleep to mechanism incontinence development. And in a 2013 study, there was found to be an increased rate of incontinence um, if the patients were a vario a, ureterectomized, that's an interesting term, um, less than three months of age uh, compared with after their first heat cycle. There are differences. We're not exactly comparing apples and apples in these cases, but you can see that there's a lot of disparity between um, the findings in these studies. Um, I have obviously been stumbling over and uh, using a term that may not be familiar to people that's in ovario uterectomy. Um, I've chosen to start doing that for an interesting reason. Um, apparently there's a strong movement within the human medicine field to rename some of the portions of the female anatomy that have been uh, named after unfortunate things or men. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon that the vast majority of anatomical features in human women are named after men who discovered them. Very few are named after women, but also um, a very hysterectomy reply really harkens back to the time when um, one of the treatment for women who were deemed to be hysterical was to remove their uterus, which is just utterly appalling when you think about it. I'd love to think that we were living in more enlightened times, but sometimes I wonder, thank you, Donald Trump. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, I'll continue to try and use this because I think it's a really nice and polite thing to do to maybe take hysteria out of the situation. Um, the relationship between USMI and a very uterectomy continued, uh, continues the, the, uh, there is a consensus statement that was published in JSAP in 2012. Um, the article is titled The Effect of Neutering on the Risk of Urinary Incontinence in Bitches, a Systematic Review. We love systematic reviews. Um, 1,853 papers were reviewed um, against fairly stringent criteria and only three of them um, met the criteria that they declared that they needed in order to try and work out if there could be any association drawn between these things. 
The conclusion from this paper was that there was some weak evidence that neutering, particularly before the age of three months, increases the risk of urinary incontinence. It probably feels a little intuitive that as well, just through general experience. However, the overall evidence is not consistent nor strong enough to make firm recommendations on the effect of neutering or age of neutering on the risk of urinary incontinence. So at the end of the day, really the evidence is very weak that there is any effect um, on the development of this condition, at least um, by the time at which the patient is desexed. It does turn out that in 2017, a relationship between the development of this condition and ovario uterectomy and the adult weight of the patient was found. So 163 dogs were assessed. Um, and it was found that in dogs that are over 25 kilograms of adult weight, not at the time of desexing, there was a decrease in the rate of the occurrence of the disease for every month delay of ovario uterectomy in the first year. For dogs that are under 25 kilograms, the time of neutering made no difference whatsoever to the rate of occurrence of this disease um, in later life. So the conclusion from this is that uh, Dogs greater than 25 kilos, we should be considering trying to desex them as late as possible in the first year of life to minimise the chances, not eliminate, but minimise the chances of them developing urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence. Um, it's a guideline, it's not a guarantee, but it's, it's a good thought. And it goes well with what Jeff was saying before about skeletal maturation and a whole bunch of other things. It, it makes a bit of logical sense really to think that um, having those hormones, they're there for a reason and they probably do influence the way that uh, bodies evolve over time. So that brings us to treatment of the condition. Once we've established that a patient has this condition, um, we've got a number of treatment options. Um, the most common one these days, I guess, um, compared to the one that's coming up next, which once upon a time was really certainly when I graduated, the only way that we treated it, um, is the use of propylin or phenylpropanolamine. Uh, phenylpropanolamine is a, an alpha-1 adrenergic ag agonist. So again, remembering back to that original picture where we had our alpha adrenergic nerves innovating the proximal urethral sphincter, in, sorry, internal urethral sphincter, by um, stimulating those receptors, we increase urethral tone, and that's exactly what propylin syrup does. About 80% of patients will respond to this drug. Um, however, some of the adverse effects can be excitement, restlessness with commas, aggression with commas, and hypertension and tachycardia without commas. Um, uh, so yeah, this drug, and for this reason, this drug is no longer used in humans. It was originally developed for treating some forms of cardiac disease in humans, I believe, but it was taken off the market and then it was repurposed um, and is now sold as propylene syrup. So not every dog will respond to it and some dogs will experience adverse side effects from it. Um, then the next one, and this is one that uh, some older clinicians, I include myself in that, thanks for the comment about the gray hair, Charles. Um, that's a pot calling the kettle black, but there you go. Um, diethos, diethyl still bistrol. Um, so this is a synthetic estrogen analog. Incurin is the veterinary specific version of this. However, there, any, any sort of preparation of diethyl still bistrol will have the same effect. Um, it's usually, control is usually induced by giving it daily for three to five days. Um, and then, oh, okay, maybe that's where the error was that PowerPoint picked up. Um, and then maintenance is once a week. So it's fairly low maintenance and low impact for people who don't want to be bothered giving medications on a daily basis. Um, but that doesn't suit some people as well. Um, it also does have some negative side effects in some cases, which can be bone marrow suppression. It can induce stump pyometra um, and unwanted attractiveness to males. Um, and then our third treatment option comes from our discussion earlier about GnRH. And the GnRH analog um, supralorin or a deslorelin implant um, can be used in some cases to manage I guess, intractable or um, recalcitrant USMI. So it, it's usually, you wouldn't use it as a first line, but putting a supralorin implant or equivalent brand in wherever you're from in the world um, can be tried if the other treatments have failed or are contraindicated for whatever reason. And some of those might be if they already have a blood dysgrasia and they're not suitable for um, having an, an estrogen analog being administered, or if they have cardiac abnormalities that preclude you from using propylene. Um, and then 
we have this treatment, surgical treatment options, which I am not going to go into at all. Um, I uh, work with a lot of clever people that know a lot more about this. I made the mistake of trying to explain this first one, colpo suspension, to somebody in front of one of our surgeons who nearly laughed me out of the room. Um, so I will back away and defer to our more experienced surgeons to explain these at a later date at some point. Um, urethral bulking agents can be useful. Um, remember back to the lady with the large lips. So this is actually endoscopically injecting collagen into the walls of the urethra at the urethral sphincter and just basically tightening everything up by occluding and narrowing the, the urethra at that point. And then we have hydraulic occluders that can be surgically implanted around the neck of the bladder um, with that little port. I'll see if I can get my mouse um, going up. Whoop, sorry. Sorry, desktop. Um, so this little port here just sits under the skin and the occluder can be inflated or deflated at will as is necessary. So that is the end of this um, discussion. I guess the conclusions that we come from this little talk are that urethral sphincter mechanism incontinent, incompetence, there it, was, there it goes again, is a diagnosis of exclusion. It is super important to rule out other causes. And within the means that you have, I mean, not everybody is going to be able to afford to do contrast CT studies and, and cystoscopy to work up every case that comes in that, um, that looks like this condition. And, you know, we all know that in many cases, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it probably is a, is a duck. And over time, you, you gain the experience to recognise these conditions without necessarily having to go through all of the diagnostic pathways. But it is always great to remember that there can be other things that can mimic this disease. And uh, you should, especially if it doesn't respond immediately to treatment, consider other things that um, could be getting in the way. So thorough workup should always be entertained. Um, the other conclusion is there is no strong evidence supporting the idea that the age of desexing affects the incidence of this disease, with the exception that dogs that have an expected adult weight of greater than 25 kilos should possibly be desexed closer to a year of age than earlier to minimise the chances of the disease um, occurring. So I'd just like to give one final acknowledgement and that's to Dr. Abigail Bruff, Bruff one of our former um, medicine residents who did a lot of the literature review um, that upon which this presentation was based. Um, and I can provide the references uh, on request. I just ran out of time to write a list like Jeff did. So, um, um, Paul, there are a couple of um, questions on the chat. Um, if you wanted to have a look at those, but um, or would you like me to read them out loud? Oh, look, I could try, but I fear that we could just disappear into my computer and never come back like we did. So could you read them out, Charles? Yeah. So the first question was, uh, hey, Paul, what are your thoughts on the theory that early desexing in females can be traumatic to the bladder neck due to excessive pulling and tension when trying to break um, right ovarian pedicles and remove the uterine stump out of a tight incision? Mm, oh, so many thoughts. And, and I guess the surgeons would also have contribution to this. But my first thought on that is a lot of that is going to be influenced by surgical technique. And... Um, you know, if the if the process, if the, the desexing goes ahead and is done with care and surgical efficiency um, and done appropriately, then those sorts of traumas shouldn't necessarily occur. Um, and that good old adage that we're all taught that wounds heal from side to side, not end to end. Um, there's no prizes for doing things through a keyhole unless you're deliberately trying to. Um, go laparoscopic surgery, that's one for you, Charles. Um, but yeah, like, I, I mean, I, I don't really see that there's, and perhaps one of the surgeons would like to jump in on this, I, you know, you shouldn't need to be digging around and reefing things out through a tiny little hole and putting undue tension and trauma on the tissues that are going to be left behind. If you can't get to it, make sure you can get to it. Don't stretch things, I would suggest. But that's a little bit outside my um, sphere of work. Um, I guess that one way that we could answer that question, and that relates to the next question, is: Is there any, are there any papers comparing the incidence of urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence comparing ovarectomy with a full ovario uterectomy? Mm, the the paper that was was the overall 
um, summary paper, um, the comparison paper did point out in just one line, and I didn't delve into it in great depth, that there was really no, considered to be no difference between an ovarian uterectomy slash hysterectomy um, and just an ovariectomy. Um, I will confess I did not pursue that pathway particularly deeply, but as reported in that consensus statement, um, there doesn't appear to be much difference at all. Um, and, I, and I would say that number one, if it was caused by tugging on the uterine body, that that effect would be eliminated by just doing an ovarectomy, ovarectomy as opposed to an ovario uterectomy. Um, the other thing is that I do a lot of surgery in the caudal abdomen where I'm tugging on the colon and I'm, you know, tugging on the, the um, uh, bladder and all kinds of things when I'm taking out sublumbar lymph nodes and I've never seen to my knowledge an animal develop uh, urethral sphincter mechanism and confidence after that surgery. So I think that's probably unlikely to be the case. I mean, if we refer back to the slide that I put that decreases in urethral closure pressure can be caused by other things other than this disease. And one of those was trauma. And I suppose it's not inconceivable that enough trauma in that area to the nerves could induce a, a syndrome that looks the same. But I don't know that that would be classed as urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence um, in the terms that we're using it here. Um, it's a good descriptor, but the disease itself is by its definition, excludes trauma being a cause. Yeah. Um, great talk. Thank you very much, Paul. And again, thanks, Jeff, for your contribution as well. Amazing information. And I'm really grateful that I was here to listen to it. I'm going to um, wrap up the night with um, a discussion about the effects of uh, early desexing on the development of cancer in animals. And so I'm just going to get that started straight away here. So can you guys see that slide? I assume you can because I can see it. Um, and then I'm just going to see if I can get the chat to come up. I cannot. Um, so um, that brings up the question, why do we as veterinarians advocate early desexing? And that's something that as vets, you know, we're always taught to desex, you know, uh, fairly early. Um, all the way from vet school, all the way up. And um, if we have issues related to potentially increased orthopedic disease, uh, possibly increased uh, urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence, uh, why, why would we advocate early desexing? Um, and the things that come to mind, number one, okay, is it for financial gain? When, well, when I look at what people are charging for desexing, in primary care practice, I imagine that at best you're breaking even, if not operating at a loss. So I don't think that anybody is getting rich doing spays and neuters in primary care practice. Um, and so I don't think that financial gain could possibly be the, um, the incentive to do uh, spays and neuters. Um, one thing that it does do is that it forms an early bond with a client. And so a client comes to you at age, you know, six months of age with their pet, that you're gonna form a rapport with that client um, and that that's gonna carry on through the rest of their pet's lives. So that may be contributing to our desire to try to get these patients in early um, for spaying and neutering. And there are a lot of other really good reasons as well. Um, so eliminate undesirable behavior, um, more common probably in human males than in animal males, but that certainly is something that, uh, that contributes to um, our decision to neuter our pets early. And I had every, I've got a, a two-year-old Labrador now, and when he was a puppy, I had this idea that I was gonna wait until he was a year and a half old to neuter him um, to try to avoid things like cruciate disease and hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia and that kind of thing. But then he started humping everything in sight at about six months and his testicles were off before the end of the week. Um, so I can certainly understand um, the behavior uh, justification for neutering early. Um, is it because we're trying to avoid them marking territory? That certainly would be the case with um, dogs and particularly cats that uh, in, uh, intact male cats are trying to you know, mark everything in sight. Uh, avoiding ag aggression. Um, and uh, I think there certainly is some indication that intact male dogs particularly can be more aggressive than neutered males. Um, inappropriate behavior. So again, that's that whole humping thing um, that uh, uh, Humphrey owes his early loss of testicles to. 
uh, roaming behavior. Promiscuity, so we don't want dogs and cats out there um, uh, reproducing uncontrolled in an uncontrolled fashion, um, contributing to overpopulation. So those are all excellent reasons to um, spay and neuter um, dogs and cats earlier. Um, now let's get to the, the nitty gritty of the study, mammary gland neoplasia. And this would be one of the biggest reasons or justification for early spaying of um, of female dogs. And so what's the evidence? Um, well, mammary gland tumors are the most common tumor in intact female dogs. Um, exogenous hormone uh, exposure increases the risk of tumor development in spayed, uh, spayed female dogs. So dogs that are on estrogen uh, specifically are going to have an increased risk of tumor development as well. And spaying definitively reduces the incidence of mammary gland tumors in dogs. And if you spay uh, female dogs before their first heat, their overall lifetime risk of mammary cancer, cancer is less than half a percent. So you can virtually eliminate mammary cancer in, um, in female dogs by spaying them before their first heat. If you spay them between their first and second heat, it's an 8% lifetime risk. And after the second heat and before the third heat, it's a 26% lifetime risk. And there's similar evidence as cats, although I'm not sure that the studies um, have been done in the degree of detail that they've been done in dogs. So spaying early definitively, absolutely positively reduces the risk of mammary gland cancer in dogs and probably cats. We can um, eliminate testicular tumors in male dogs by neutering them and I don't think that you need to neuter them early specifically for that, but um, obviously you can definitively, you, can, you know, you can't have a headache if you don't have a head. So if we eliminate the testicles, we're gonna eliminate the um, risk of testicular cancer. Um, vaginal leiomyomas and leiomyosarcomas are not common, but we certainly see them with some frequently and they occur almost exclusively in female dogs and they will regress with spaying. Ovarian neoplasia is uncommon to rare in dogs, but obviously if you're spaying these dogs, you're gonna eliminate that risk. Perianal gland adenomas, which are benign tumors in male dogs, occur almost exclusively in intact males and will regress spontaneously when they're neutered. Now, interestingly, this is where the tide turns, that prostatic carcinoma, the risk increases in neutered dogs, so increases two to eight times that of intact male dogs. Although leaving a dog intact doesn't eliminate the risk, um, it does reduce the risk, but recognize that prostatic carcinoma overall is a fairly low risk um, uh, situation. Osteosarcoma, it's been shown probably again related to what Jeff was talking to, about relating to physial closure and stuff like that, that um, neutering increases um, the risk of osteosarcoma in dogs that have been spayed and castrated early. Hemangiosarcoma has an increased risk in males and females that are spayed and castrated, and also in those that are spay, uh, uh, castrated early. Lymphoma. Early spaying and castration increases the risk of lymphoma in dogs, all dogs. Um, and more specifically in Beazlers and Golden Retrievers. So we can see a trend here that with the exception of um, the uh, urinary, specifically the genitor urinary structures that early spaying, appear, early spaying and neutering appears to increase the risk of a lot of different cancers. So we're looking again to review prostatic carcinoma, osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, lymphoma, transitional cell carcinoma also Spaying and neutering increases the risk of development of transitional cell carcinoma in female dogs, male dogs, and also the prostate of male dogs. Mast cell tumor, spaying and neuter, increases the risk of development of mast cell tumors in male and female dogs. So um, in contrast to that, well, there was a study that looked at the overall lifespan of dogs and they looked at 40,000 dogs and they found that neutered females live 26% longer than intact females and neutered males live 14% longer 
than intact males. And so that's a whole lifestyle thing related to, I mean, they, they didn't really separate out um, the fact that maybe neutered male and female dogs were also more likely to be well cared for by their owners. That was not borne out one way or the other by the study. Um, but um, it did show that overall lifespan was longer if you neutered male and female dogs. Also, neutered dogs were more likely to die of cancer, specifically transitional cell carcinoma, osteosarcoma, lymphoma, and mast cell tumors. And neutered dogs were less likely to get mammary cancer. There was another study that was 2.2 million dogs, and they found that neutered females lived 23% longer than intact females, and neutered males lived 18% longer than intact, and neutered males lived 18% longer than intact males. Another study looking at 460,000 cats, neutered females lived 39% longer than intact females, and neutered males lived 62% longer than intact males. And some of that is going to be behavioral uh, issues that are related to being intact um, compared to being neutered, um, related to roaming, potentially fighting, um, those types of things. Um, and so while those factors were not um, uh, specifically elucid elucidated in these studies, we did see, you know, if you need a reason to neuter dogs and cats early, um, these two studies certainly would support that. So again, critiques of the studies were that they didn't include things like diet, occupation of the, um, uh, of the family members, environment, smoke exposure. So if the owners were smokers, that was not included and other genetics um, uh, and were not considered in the reported studies. Um, and uh, most studies were done at referral centers, and so these may not be representative of the general pet population, may represent variations in geography, finance, willingness to treat, and certainly in the United States, um, and, and uh, probably in Australia and other countries as well, vet schools tend to be uh, associated with universities, which are in kind of uh, suburban, uh, highly affluent, and highly educated areas associated with universities. And so that may skew some of our results. Uh, also, clients who couldn't afford sterilization may not be able to afford presentation to referral centers. So there are confounding factors that uh, probably play a role in these results that, that have not been borne out specifically, but the results of the studies do suggest that spaying and neutering early does um, cause or, or is associated with longer lifespans in dogs and cats. Um, many of the studies were breed specific and may not apply to the general pet population. And um, many of the studies involve surveys of breed clubs and breeders, and these may not represent the non-breeding population. And also since there were surveys, people with a specific agenda one way or another may have had a confirmation or may have had a bias when responding to surveys that may have supported their um, their opinion about uh, staying and neutering versus leaving uh, pets intact. Um, and overall, the responses to the questionnaires were low, selecting basically only for people that were willing to respond. And maybe there are some behaviors associated with people that are willing to respond to a survey that might also affect, it the, way, affect the way that they treat their pets. Um, all of the studies were retrospective which also introduces bias and potentially incomplete data collection. And in many studies, the age of neutering wasn't addressed. Um, there is an exhaustive prospective study being carried out by the Morris Animal Foundation, which is one of the largest research support groups um, in the world that uh, uh, specifically sponsor uh, very, very high quality research. So other factors to consider when you're looking at spaying and neutering pets Pyometra, you can virtually eliminate pyometra from your pet population by spaying and particularly spaying early. early. Um, benign prostatic hypertrophy can be eliminated by uh, neutering um, and, and you can also have issues with prostatitis, prostatic abscesses, uh, and urinary and defecation problems related to prostatic enlargement. Um, some cancers that are reported to have a higher incidence in neutered dogs are very rare. Um, and so that should be considered, for example, the ovarian cancer 
in female dogs. I don't know that I've ever seen a case. If I've seen it, it's been very rare. Um, and so that needs to be considered as well. Um, mammary gland cancer, on the other hand, is very, very common and can be almost eliminated by early staying. So neutering in, in uh, summary increases the risk or is associated with an uh, increased risk of mast cell disease, osteosarcoma, lymphoma, osteosarcoma, sorry, I said that twice, didn't I? It's really important. Um, hemangiosarcoma, transitional cell carcinoma, and prostatic carcinomas decreases the risk of all the um, genitor urinary tract um, cancers, including mammary gland tumors, testicular tumors, ovarian tumors, vaginal tumors, uterine tumors, prostatitis, and pyometra, and results in a significantly larger or longer lifespan in dogs and cats in extremely large studies of 2.2 million dogs and 460,000 cats. And that's pretty much all I have to say. So I'm just going to go into the chat now. I'll stop my screen sharing and open up to um, any questions that you might have or any comments by my co-panelists um, tonight. I'm just looking through. Um, and that's a really good point somebody has made, um, Simone has made, uh, is, is that there's a huge overpopulation um, of uh, dogs and cats all over the world, um, and particularly in developing countries, which certainly contributes to the, um, uh, the idea that spaying and neutering should be performed early. Also, um, when you have lots of dogs and cats roaming all over the place, there's much higher risk of trauma. Um, there's also somebody commented that there's shy requirements in some area, um, we need to register by three months in some areas won't allow registration of um, entire pet animals. Um, and question about what is our definition of early desexing? I'd say probably less than about eight months of age, you know, before the first heat in females and probably between six and eight months of, months of age in males. Um, and then uh, there's from Melissa, there's a question about the age of desexing and they did not specifically mention um, the age of desexing in those really big studies. Um, let's see. Um, so the mammary cancer, they didn't go into specifics about benign versus malignant, but overall we can say that with mammary cancer, about 50% are mal uh, malignant, 50% are benign, and of the 50% that are malignant, about half of them are in situ, and the other half have spread. So overall, with mammary cancer, you're looking at about 25% being highly malignant and likely to metastasize and 75% either being completely benign or low grade malignant. Um, and uh, there's a question from Shani, do I agree with the recommendation in the article I posted in the chat of desexing in specific breeds? I actually haven't read it in enough detail to have an opinion. Um, somebody just sent that to me today and, and they said that they use that as their guideline. Um, let's see. There's another question. Is it possible that the reason neuter males have more cancers is because they live longer? Um, and that's, um, that's a really, really great point uh, that cancer tends to be an old age disease. And if you have animals living 25% longer, it's more likely that they're going to be getting more cancer. So, um, uh, so that's an excellent point. Uh, other larger dogs, what about these? Oh. Yes. I was just going to make a point in regards to Simone's uh, question earlier about overpopulation. There's some interesting work and, and uh, information that comes out of some of the Scandinavian countries, such as Finland and Sweden, where desexing is actually illegal. Um, and the vast majority of the population is uh, entire. Um, only those that have a specific medical requirement are desexed and there aren't any issues with overpopulation in these um, countries. They basically don't even have humane societies for stray animals as it just doesn't happen. Um, and that's a really interesting point. And obviously that's a, a highly, highly developed um, region of the uh, world as far as uh, level of, uh, you know, socioeconomic level and stuff like that. And so I think that that finding obviously would not apply in in less developed countries. Um, 
there's another question about in large dogs, what about desexing early and then supplementing with estrogen and testosterone, um, but they won't have a heat? I, I, I can't answer that question. It's an interesting point. I don't know if any of my other co-panelists um, have any comments on that. And then the question about increased risk of transitional cell carcinoma, osteosarcoma, lymphoma, and mast cell tumor compared to the increase in mammary cancer of 26%. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Um, really good points um, to consider. Uh, and uh, a question from Shawnee, any thoughts on whether using superlorin instead of surgical desexing is beneficial? I don't know the answer to that. So uh, really great discussion tonight and I appreciate, and I know that, that people feel very strongly one way or another. Um, if it were my dog, uh, personally, I would try to wait until, if it was a male dog, I'd try to wait till about a year and a half uh, before I neutered him in a female dog. My preference would be to spay before the first heat. Um, that's how I would treat my own dogs. Any other questions or comments? What are your thoughts on educating owners and breeders about mammary gland monitoring, palpating regularly for mammary tumors? I think that, uh, Melissa, that's a good point. I don't think that's a bad idea. The problem is that in a quarter of the cancers, um, a quarter of mammary gland tumors, that they're going to be um, likely to be metastatic um, and, and might have metastasized even by the time they were detected um, with um, uh, uh, mammary gland palpation. Uh, and desexing, um, I would desex my own cats early. Um, I think probably six months of age um, for males and females. For males, because of inappropriate behavior and marking and roaming and that kind of thing. And then for females to prevent the risk of mammary cancer. Any other questions or comments? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. I do wanna remind you that we are open. Um, uh, and you can get a letter to travel to South Falls if, um, if you have an appointment there, and that will allow you to go outside of your five kilometer radius from home if you're in Victoria. Um, number one, number two, we do have Mornington, uh, South Falls Mornington uh, open as well, and, um, and that they're fully operational seeing patients um, uh, cutting, I think, Monday through Friday, and then on the weekends, things come up to Moorabbin. So thank you very much. And thanks for the lovely comments that we've had from everybody. And um, yeah, we hope to do another presentation probably in the next two or three months. Thanks again. And we will talk to you soon.